Let us rise for the gospel acclamation and the reading of the gospel. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Lord. On this third Sunday after Epiphany, 2021, the word comes to us from St. Mark's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 14 to 20. How long should a sermon be? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every preacher preaches that first sermon. I remember mine. It was the first Sunday after Easter in 1998. And it was good that it was that Sunday, because that's the Sunday, the first Sunday after Easter, when the church is nearly empty. Uh, a good time for a preacher to preach his first sermon. Uh, preachers usually need a break that day, and, and uh, so the pastor needed a break, and, and he called upon me, and I was a college student at the Millersville University of Pennsylvania, uh, the Harvard on the Susquehanna. And so I, I didn't really know what to do, but I thought I'd give it a try. And what I did was, uh, instead of really working with the Bible as, as a pastor or as a preacher should, um, I went and, and, and started reading other people's sermons. Uh, I thought at that time, if I, if I took a little bit of John Wesley and a little bit of Martin Luther and a little bit of Billy Graham, that I'd be better than all of them. Um, while I was doing that during the week, uh, nervously working on that, my mom, who's actually here this morning, uh, took me to the mall to buy me a new suit. She did not want her son stepping into the pulpit looking like a rag bag. Right? The next Billy Graham needed to look like Billy Graham. So, on the Friday before I was to preach this first sermon, I, um, I was to preach it before the pastor who was taking that Sunday off and the president of the congregation of where I was preaching. And... Uh, They sat in the pews and listened intently, and after the sermon, the president of the congregation caught me in the hallway, I believe it was, and says to me, Jeff, it's just a bit too short. I think you need to lengthen the sermon a little bit. I wish I would have been smart enough to point him to our gospel lesson this morning from St. Mark, uh, because there Jesus is preaching his first sermon. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. What's that take? About three seconds? Yeah? So what I did was I went back to the computer. Instead of, again, going to the Bible and working with the Bible to go deeper into the text, I scoured my books and and Reader's Digest and and, uh, the computer looking for uh, more interesting and edifying quotes that I could shoo into the sermon to give it some more length. You can see where this is all going, right? So on that Sunday, uh, that first Sunday after Easter, 1998, I was to preach at two services. And I put my new suit on, nervous. I carried my mom's Bible with me uh, and an antique book of theology I had gotten at a used book sale. I I think I brought that antique book of theology into the pulpit uh, because if the sermon still wasn't long enough, with all of my shoehorned quotes and things like that, I could perhaps pull out this book of antique theology and just start reading it to the saints. Right? Uh, Luckily, it didn't 
thankfully didn't come to that. All I have to say about my first sermon um, is this. Uh, my poor wife had to listen to it 20 times in practice and then twice on Sunday and still told me after the Sunday service, good job, uh, even though it was far from it. My mom still gave me a pride, pride-filled hug and a kiss. And the dear saints at Trinity United Methodist Church in Denver, just down the road from here, still shook my hand afterwards and thanked me for bringing the word to them. As I look back on my first sermon, as you can probably tell by the way it was formulated, it was a mess. The fact is I had no idea what the job of a preacher was about, uh, what I was supposed to be doing in that pulpit. I thought my job as a preacher was to edify, um, which I clearly did not with multiple quotes from all over history. Uh, to persuade people, perhaps. And I certainly didn't do that that morning. Um, I thought my job in the pulpit was to cheer people up into God's kingdom, to encourage them. And of course, that kind of preaching exists all over the church these days. And most of it, almost all of it, comes off to us who fall short of God's kingdom daily in our lives. Most of it comes off as law. Accusing law at that. No one is edified into God's kingdom by a pep talk on Sunday. No one is motivated to live up to God's standards for kingdom living by some sort of halftime speech given in some pulpit somewhere. What we need are sermons like we heard from our Lord Christ in St. Mark's Gospel this morning. We need straight good news in a world full of lies and outrage. Jesus, in this short sermon that he gives to us, the first sermon that he preaches as a preacher, his first words are this, the time is fulfilled. St. Paul will later echo this to the church in Corinth when he says, today is the day of salvation. The time is fulfilled, dear Christians. Today is the day of salvation. And we need to know this first off. All of the waiting that God's people did throughout the Old Testament, generation after generation, has come to an end for them and for us. Jesus, the Son of the living God, has come among us into our mess, into our brokenness, among all of you and your trials and troubles and problems. And he is here to bring you not a word of condemnation or a word of God's wrath. Instead, he says to you and to me, the kingdom of God is at hand. And now, because I'm a gospel preacher and I I seem to have a sense of what I'm supposed to be doing in the pulpit now, I'll add this specifically. The kingdom of God is at hand for you. The kingdom of God is at hand for you. Christians, we pray for this every day. Thy kingdom come, we pray. And with the coming of Jesus in the flesh, this time is fulfilled. By our Lord Christ's atoning death and glorious resurrection, the gates of God's kingdom have been thrown open for sinners. St. Paul puts it this way to the Colossians. He's delivered us from the domain of darkness. He's transferred us from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's what we have in God's kingdom. The forgiveness of sins. At its basic level, the sermon is made up of just two words. The gospel sermon is made up of two words. For you. For you. Christ is for you. God's kingdom is for you. For you, Christ comes. For you and your sins, Christ goes to the cross. For you, Christ conquers death. For you, Christ ascends to the Father and sits at the right hand. For you, Christ rules His kingdom and His church. Not by law or force. That's what governments and kingdoms in this world Christ rules with a sure and certain word of unconditional promise to each of us. Sermons need not be long. 
but they must always deliver Christ and Him for you, for His people. There is no persuading or edifying people into God's kingdom. There is no nudging them on to holiness or virtuousness. I mean, look at how Peter and Andrew and James and John react to hearing this word from Jesus. They don't huddle up among themselves and say, you know, fellas, do do we follow this guy? Do we make a decision about going after him? No. They drop their stuff and they follow. Here's why. God's word never returns empty. God's word never returns empty. This powerful word of God that comes to us externally into our ears, joined to the Holy Spirit, turns us around. That's what repentance is. Turns us around and then places us on the path following Jesus to a new life, to a path following Jesus, homeward bound to God's kingdom. Day in and day out, as Christians, we need to hear again that short sermon, Jesus is for you. The world all around us tells us lies, that this person is for us, or that institution is for us, until they're not. Jesus says, this is my body given for you. This is my blood shed for you. And he means it. He means it all the way. That's a sermon we all need to hear again and again. In Jesus' name.